welcome everybody to Rise and Shine, our daily Bible study time. Rise and Shine was designed in order to inspire you uh, to think differently about your life, to inform you about the pathway that God has provided for, for you and to impact your life in ways that you never imagined possible. Today we're taking a look at Matthew chapter 18. We've been going through this uh, study through the Gospel of Matthew, the good news about what Jesus is doing and about the world that He's opening up before us in the kingdom of heaven. We're trying to understand what does it mean to call Jesus the Messiah or the Christ? Um, what, are, what are we saying when we say all of that? Last time we got together in the uh, chapter 17, we looked at the, the transfiguration. What does that mean when Jesus is transfigured and you hear uh, God speak from the heavens, um, this is my son whom I love, in him I am well pleased, listen to him. Now the journey is going to continue from here all the way to Jerusalem and along the way it's going to be refined, the message is going to be refined in terms of what is it that Jesus is really sharing with us, what is he opening up before us and how is it challenging the world in which we live. This is, this is not just a tweak or a new government system or a new culture. This is a kingdom that is uh, turning our world on its head. So as we begin to, uh, chapter 18, I hope that you have your Bibles. I hope that you're ready, um, ready to dig in and continue on our faith journey. Um, I can see by the clock on the wall, it's time for our prayer. We pray both for the church and for you. Um, I hope that if you have any special prayer requests, needs on your heart that you'll let me know that we can uh, continue to share that and be encouragers of one another on this journey. Um, if you want to, I, I hope that you'll get this magnet and, and join us uh, on our journey. Let us pray together. Father, I pray that you will bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything we could ask or imagine. And Father, I ask a blessing on those that are gathered through this new medium uh, that your spirit would Go across and, and touch each and every one of us. Open our hearts and our minds. Open our ears that we may hear and our eyes that we may see. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so in chapter 17, as we, we look back, we, we talked before about how the Gospels were never written with chapter titles. They weren't broken, broken up that way. Um, and so we look at the, the journey that we've kind of gone through. Uh, we've gone through... The transfiguration, and again, Jesus is, has been talking all along about how the Messiah, God's anointed one, will be a suffering servant. He will be handed over uh, to sinful people, and he will be crucified. He will, he will be killed. Um, now, that seems almost counterintuitive because it makes it sound like evil is going to win this battle. Now, Jesus keeps talking about, but on the third day he will rise again. But at this point in our story, we're not really clear what that means. Um, and so we have to look at where we are in the story and not jump ahead and, and look at it through that lens. All right? So we're looking at chapter 18. Chapter 18 takes a, a bit of a, a, a wonderful twist and allows us to see both ourselves and the story that Jesus is, is talking about. So I want you to listen for the question that is being asked and how the rest of the chapter flows out of that question, how it defines who we are. All right, so let's begin jumping into chapter 18, uh, verse 1. Now, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, so he called a, ch a little child and he had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into an eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two and to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you, 
that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go and look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about the one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as he refuses, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that, two, that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. He, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The fellow servant fell on his knees and he begged him, Be patient with me, I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown in, his, in prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so what do you think is the central question that is driving these discussions, these stories of, you know, the, the, the parable of the lost sheep and, of course, the parable of the, the wicked servant? Well, it really begins chapter 18, right? Jesus, the, the disciples come off of the Mount of Transfiguration. They're, you know, they're kind of pumped that, you know, we're, we're headed toward Jerusalem. Um, Jesus is moving in that direction, and of course, they ask the question that is central to the world in which we live, right? I mean, if you think about people that you live around, people that are around you, how many of them are just saying, which of us is the greatest? Which, which one of us is more lovable? Which one of us is, has a better life? Which one of us do you think God loves more? And of course, the disciples are, are moving towards the kingdom of heaven and God's kingdom. And of course, they're already trying to posture themselves to figure out who's, who's going to have the highest position. It kind of makes you wonder, like a lot of the problems that we have in our world with, with disease, with greed, with poverty, how many, of, how many of that is because people are trying to be the greatest in the kingdom of the world? They're trying to have more than they need. Uh, right now, I've been watching um, about the disparity that exists between wealth in our country, the, the haves and the have-nots. Who's trying to become the greatest? And so they come into Jesus and they're saying, look, we're your little band here. Um, which of us is going to be the greatest in your kingdom? And of course, Jesus then comes and he tries to, to give them this image of this little child. Now, it's hard for us to imagine what image that must have had on the disciples, right? I mean, children were to be seen and not heard, and most of the time, if possible, not even seen. And so Jesus says, do you see this little child? Unless you become like this little child. So 
what is it that Jesus is trying to drive at? Um, a child certainly has the humility of a child. A child can't come up and say, hey, you, I, you owe it to me, right? A child is heavily dependent upon its parents. It is totally dependent on those that are around us. And in the same way, what Jesus is saying is your total dependence on what God is doing in your life. Get out of your mind of what I can do for myself and ask the question, what God is on your heart? Do you begin each day with prayer, asking God, God, tell me about our day together? Or do we come instead and say, God, let me tell you about the things that I want to do, and how about you come along with me? Jesus said, we must become like a little child. Do you remember what that was like when you were a child and your parents, you know, they were the ones that dictated the schedule, this is what we're going to do, but they also, you also had a deep trust that they would take care of you. That's what Jesus is trying to get to, that total dependence, that total trust, and the humility of a child for its parents. Unless you become, in our relationship with God in the kingdom, unless you become like a little child, you will never enter it. Now, for disciples that are trying to become like their rabbi, this must have been just a, an incredible shock. And this is what's driving the rest of this, this total sense of humility um, when we come before God. The second thing that we understand is not just humility, but our incredible responsibility that we have for one another. Because, of course, what Jesus follows that up with is, you know, how you take care of, if you create a situation where any of these little ones, any of my people stumble, they're all children with our Heavenly Father. And if any of them stumble, that Jesus said, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck. Now, for Jewish thought, they... they they really shunned uh, the sea. This is where oftentimes when the Sea of Galilee is in turmoil or there's this storm that comes up quickly, it's not just, you know, a, a windstorm. It's more the chaotic world that is surrounding them. For Jewish thought, the, the sea was a, a source of chaos, of depth that we did not understand, right? Because out of, you know, the, in, in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God mo hovered across the water, and created order out of the chaos that was the, the water. Out of that came light and darkness. And so for Jewish thought, the ocean or the metaphor of the sea is a source of chaos, things that are just completely uncontrollable. And so Jesus is saying to some extent, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the chaos of the universe if you cause one of these little ones to sin. And so you see this imagery of children and he, he moves on into the, the story of the lost sheep of saying, you know, it, my, my father, the angels of heaven are, are representing the children before my father in heaven. And he talks about how important it is for us to be watching out for, for all of God's children. And that's kind of the focus of the, the parable that he tells about the lost sheep, that we would go to the ends of the earth to find that one lost sheep to be part of our flock, we, we look out for it. And he said, well, how much more will God do that for us? And we should do that for one another to seek them out, which follows right on with Peter thinking he's being very magnanimous. And he said, well, I'd be willing to forgive my brother seven times um, if, he, if he sins against me. As a matter of fact, Jewish rabbis taught that you really only needed to forgive three times. After four times, you can get vengeance. That's, that's fair game. And so Peter's trying to be very magnificent. He said, I'm going to double it. He said, it, should I forgive my brother seven times? <clears throat> Jesus blows him out of the water. He said, not seven times, but 11 times that, 77 times. Basically, he's saying just by a number that you can't count to go beyond everything that, that is imaginable. But you, we have to forgive one another because there's this moment here of what's called forgiveness reciprocity. What Jesus is talking about is, is whatever you do, however you forgive other people, is how you will be forgiven. This is what you consider the highest standard. This is why Jesus is encouraging us to continue to grow into this, not just say, well, I've done the minimum. It's about growing into the fullness of what God has in store. So, of course, we have to be looking at our lives and saying, 
how are we forgiving other people? How are we forgiving one another? And of course, he ends this section with the unmerciful servant. And in hindsight, we can kind of see what Jesus is talking about in terms of God's incredible gift to us, that he has one servant that comes that owes this incredible amount. He's trying to give um, uh, Peter an image of what it's like. He said he, owns, he owes him 10,000 talents, which is just this incredible amount, far more than he could ever even possibly try and imagine. And so he begs, he said, give me time to pay for it. And the master is kind of going, this is never going to happen. Not in your lifetime are you going to pay this back. He owes his entire life. That's essentially what Jesus is trying to say. But his master forgives him, just as God has forgiven you. God is completely justified in claiming your life because we have disobeyed, we have abandoned the covenant that we belong to. Whenever we take communion, we have not lived up to the, to the standards. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not heeded what God has invited us. God is completely justified in our condemnation, and yet He forgives us all that we have. What happens is oftentimes we see only ourselves our sin is just very minor and very circumstantial. Well, I wouldn't have had a problem if, if it hadn't been for this circumstance. There are certain uh, conditions or excuses that we have that excuse our own behavior. But when other people sin against us, it's because of their character, because they're very bad people. Jesus is turning that around, uh, turning it on its head and said, now, if you really believe that you have been forgiven an awful lot, that you've been forgiven 10,000, that you've had your life restored, then you will naturally want to forgive those that are around you. That same generosity, that same mercy, that same grace will, will overflow in your life to other people. So how you treat others is a reflection of what you think about God. By the same token, how you study, Bible study, how you pray, how you give is a reflection of how you, what your faith is and what God is doing in your life. So the story of the unmerciful servant is a very powerful story. Um, at the very end, in the very last, this is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Not just go through the motions, but from your deepest soulful place in life. So we begin by asking, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Where, how do we posture ourselves to get ourselves in the right shape, in the right place? How do we begin the same competition that we see in this world? And Jesus said, it's totally different in the kingdom. In the kingdom, it's based on uh, humility. It's based on mercy and forgiveness. If, when you understand that, you will find your place in the kingdom. It is about forgiveness, reciprocity. How you react to other people, what you give to other people, is a reflection of how you feel that you have been treated by God. Do you have that kind of relationship? Do you have that kind of faith? One of the struggles that we all have is that we often will say the right words, we'll use the right words, but we don't really embrace them in our hearts. We don't really live it out. How you live, our actions reflect our faith. This is where faith and works kind of come together, two sides of the same coin. If you have faith, it will express itself in good works. If you are a good kind, it is because deep inside there is a faith that is continuing to overflow. So here's the challenge for you today. How is your faith guiding your actions? How is your unbelief guiding your actions? Next time we're going to be taking a look at chapter 19, um, which has some powerful stories. I love the story of the rich young man, which is in um, all of the synoptics. Um, powerful story about how we live before God. Until that time, friends, I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit will rest upon you, upon the hearing of your word, and the living it out each and every day. Until next time, God bless.